Amen. Our memory text this week is Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Let's read that again, Exodus 19, verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. HMS Richards wrote an article titled Free Grace in the Voice of Prophecy News in June 1950, and it reads... A little boy, one of seven children, met with an accident and was taken to the hospital. In his home, there was seldom enough of anything. He never had more than just a part of a glass of milk. If the glass was full, it was shared by two of the children, and whoever drank first had to be careful not to drink too far. After the little fellow was made comfortable in the hospital, the nurse brought him a large glass of milk. He looked at it longingly for a moment, and then, with the memory of privations at home, asked, How deep shall I drink? The nurse, with her eyes shining and a lump in her throat, said, Drink it all, child. Drink it all. End of quote. Like this boy, it was the privilege of ancient Israel, as it is our own, to drink deeply from the wells of salvation. Israel's deliverance from centuries of slavery and oppression was a marvellous exhibition of divine grace. Likewise, divine grace is involved in our own emancipation from sin. And here's the week at a glance. What imagery did the Lord use to describe his relationship with Israel? In what ways do the stories of the Exodus and Sinai parallel personal salvation? What was the role of the law in the Sinai Covenant. Sunday, May 9, on Eagle's Wings. As a people, Israel had been immersed in Egyptian paganism for many long, hard centuries, an experience that no doubt dimmed their knowledge of God, His will, and His goodness. How could the Lord win them back to Himself? For starters, He would demonstrate the genuineness of His love for Israel, and He did this through His mighty acts of deliverance. He would begin to woo the nation into a loving response to His covenant proposal. At Sinai, God first reminded the nation of His gracious acts in their behalf. Question, what two illustrations describe the manner in which the Lord brought Israel from Egypt to Sinai? And we'll have two sets of verses here for this one. The first is Exodus 19, verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. And we're comparing that with Deuteronomy 32, verses 10 and to 12. He found him in a desert land, and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness, he encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign god with him. And then another pair of texts, Deuteronomy one twenty nine to 31 Then I said to you, Do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. And Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Another question. What would these illustrations teach Israel and us about the nature of God's attitude toward his people? These illustrations indicate that our God is very much aware of our helplessness. 
Read Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. In both the figures of the eagle and the parent carrying his child, we sense God's concern for our well-being. Tender, supportive, protective, encouraging, he desires to bring us to full maturity. Writing in Theology of Narration, page 128, George A. F. Knight says, The eagle was known for its unusual devotions to its young. It, too, lived on mountain tops. In teaching its young to fly, it carried them upon its back to those great depths that overlooked the plains of Sinai. Then it dropped them down into the depths. If the baby was still too young and too bewildered to fly, Father Eagle would swoop down beneath it, catch it on his back, and then fly him up again with it to the eerie on the crags above. And that, says the divine voice, is how I brought you out of Egypt to myself. Contrast God's interest in us with our interest for one another. How should his concern for us affect our concern for others? And so to finish the day, based on your personal experience, what illustrations can you think of to describe God's unselfish interest in us? Make up a few images of your own, from your own experiences. Draw up also from whatever culture you live in. Share them with the class. Monday, May 10. The Pattern of Salvation Say therefore, we read in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Look at the above verses. What principle do we see in them, as before, regarding the role of God toward humanity in the covenant relationship? Focus on how often the word I appears in those verses. So let's read that again. Exodus 6 verses 6 and 7. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from the bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, and I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. The deliverance of Israel from Egyptian slavery and the deliverance of Noah and his family from the flood are the two prominent salvific events in the writings of Moses. Both provide insights into the science of salvation, but it is the Exodus event in particular that provides the basic pattern. When God says to Israel through Moses, I will redeem you, in verse 6, he literally says, I will act as the kinsman redeemer, or Goel. Writing in His Way Out, Bernard L. Ram, on page 50 of that book, writes, the word redeem in verse 6 of Exodus 6 refers to a member of a family buying back or ransoming another member of the family, especially when that member was in slavery for debt or about to go into slavery. Israel apparently had no earthly relative to redeem her, but God was now Israel's relative, her kinsman redeemer. Question. How do you understand the idea of God's ransoming or buying back his people from slavery? What was the price that had to be paid? What does that tell us about our worth? 
First of all, Mark 10.45 For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And First Timothy 2 verse 6 Who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. And Revelation 5 and verse 9 And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 8, God says that he has come down to rescue Israel. This is a common Hebrew verb for God's interaction with humanity. God is in heaven and we are on earth, and only as God comes down to earth can he redeem us. In the truest sense of the idea, only when Jesus came down, lived, suffered, died, and was resurrected for us, could we be redeemed. And as it says in John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us is another way of saying that God came down in order to save us. Tuesday, May 11 the Sinai Covenant. The book of Exodus draws the reader's attention to three major events, like three mountains, the Exodus itself, the establishment of the covenant, and the building of the tabernacle sanctuary rise above the foothills of lesser happenings. The establishment of the covenant recorded in Exodus 19 through to chapter 24 was the Mount Everest of the three. A brief outline of Exodus 19 through 24 shows the sequence and the relationship of events. Even if you do not have the time to look up all the verses listed below, focus on the sequence of events. 1. Israel's arrival and encampment at Sinai after being delivered by the Lord, Exodus 19, verses 1 and 2. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And then Number two, God's proposal of a covenant with Israel occurs in verses three to six. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And then three, there was Israel's response in acceptance of the covenant. And uh, verses 7 and 8, So Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together, and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And 4. Preparations for formally receiving the covenant. And that goes on from verses 9 to 25. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. You shall set bounds on the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him. 
but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. And number five, there is the story of the Ten Commandments. And although I didn't read all of the, the previous verses, I'm going to read all of the Ten Commandments here in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness or anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates." For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbour's. And six, Moses as covenant mediator. We read in Exodus 20 verses 18 to 21. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings and the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. And seven the covenant principles were spelled out, beginning in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 22, and going on for three whole chapters. I'm just going to read some important verses from this whole series. Then the Lord said to Moses in verse 22 of chapter 20 of Exodus, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or silver. Or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. And this continues right through to chapter 23, and we'll finish with verses 20 to 22. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way, to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But... If you indeed obey my voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. And eight, the ratification of the covenant occurs in Exodus 24, 
verses 1 to 18. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning, and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel, who offered burnt offerings, and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them." Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. This covenant plays a vital role in the plan of salvation. It is the fourth covenant listed in the Bible, preceded by the ones with Adam, Noah, and Abraham. And in it, God reveals himself more fully than before, particularly as the entire sanctuary ritual is established. Thus, the sanctuary becomes the means by which he shows the people the plan of salvation that they were to reveal to the world. Though the Lord had redeemed Israel from the bondage of Egypt, he wanted them to understand that redemption had a greater and more significant meaning than merely freedom from physical bondage. He wanted to redeem them from sin, the ultimate slavery, and this could happen only through the sacrifice of the Messiah, as taught in the types and symbols of the sanctuary service. It is no wonder, then, that not long after they were redeemed from bondage and given the law, the Israelites were instructed to build the sanctuary and establish its services, for in these things God revealed to them the plan of redemption, which is the true meaning and purpose of the covenant. For the covenant is nothing if not a covenant of salvation that the Lord offers to fallen humanity. That is what it was in Eden. And that is what it was at Sinai. And so to finish the day, why was a covenant between God and the people of Israel a necessity? Notice again as we read Deuteronomy 29, 10-11, the relational aspect of the covenant. Deuteronomy 29, beginning at verse 10, All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, 
from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you, just as he has spoken to you, and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wednesday, May 12, God and Israel Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6 reads, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. In these verses, the Lord was proposing his covenant with the children of Israel. Though in one sense the Lord had called them, that calling was not automatically bestowed upon them without their choice. They had to cooperate. Even their deliverance from Egypt involved their cooperation. If they had not done what the Lord had said, such as putting the blood on the doorposts, they would not have been delivered. It was that simple. Here, too, the Lord does not say to them, Whether you like it or don't like it, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me and a nation of priests. That is not how it works. And that is not what the text says. So, read Exodus 19, 5 and 6 quoted above. How do you understand what the Lord is saying in the context of salvation by faith? Does the command included there to obey the Lord somehow nullify the concept of salvation by grace? How do the following texts help you to understand the answer? Romans three nineteen to twenty four, Romans six one and two, Romans seven seven, and Revelation fourteen twelve. Let's read Exodus nineteen five and six again. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And we're going to follow up by reading Romans three nineteen to 24. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. And Revelation 14 verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints, and here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In the little book Steps to Christ, page 61, we read this gem, We do not earn salvation by our obedience, for salvation is the free gift of God to be received by faith. But obedience is the fruit of faith. End of quote. 
Think of what the Lord was willing to do for the nation of Israel. Not only did he miraculously deliver them from the Egyptian bondage, but he also wanted to make them his own treasured possession, a nation of priests. Basing their relationship with him upon his salvation, both temporal, as from Egyptian slavery, and eternal, the Lord sought to elevate them to a spiritual, intellectual, and moral level that would make them the wonder of the ancient world, all for the purpose of using them to preach the gospel to the nations. All they had to do in response was obey. And so to finish today, in what ways should our personal one-on-one -on -one experience with the Lord reflect that same principle we see here in today's study? Thursday, May 13. Promises, Promises. Our text for today is Exodus 19 and verse 8. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. At first sight, all seems well. The Lord delivers his people, offers them the covenant promises, and they agree. They will do all that the Lord asks them to do. It is a deal made in heaven, right? Read the following texts. What insight do they give us regarding Israel's response to the covenant? First of all, Romans 9, 31 and 32. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And Romans 10.3 For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And Hebrews 4 verses 1 and 2 Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Whatever God asks us to do, our relationship with Him must be founded upon faith. Faith provides the basis upon which works follow. Works, in and of themselves, no matter how purely motivated, no matter how sincere, no matter how numerous, can't make us acceptable in the sight of a holy God. They could not do it either in Israel's time, and they cannot in our time as well. If, however, the Bible again and again stresses works, why can't works make us acceptable in God's sight? And we're going to look at several texts here. The first is Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. Unfortunately, the Hebrew people believed that their obedience became the means of their salvation, not the result of salvation. They sought righteousness in their obedience to the law, not the righteousness of God which comes by faith. The Sinai Covenant, though coming with a much more detailed set of instructions and law, was designed a covenant of grace as much as all the preceding covenants as well. This grace freely bestowed, brings about a change of heart that leads to obedience. The problem, of course, was not their attempt to obey. The covenant demanded that they obey. The problem was the kind of obedience they rendered. 
which wasn't really obedience at all, as the subsequent history of the nation showed. And so to finish the day, read carefully Romans 10 verse 3, particularly the last part. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. What point is Paul making here? What happens to people who seek to establish their own righteousness? Why does that attempt inevitably lead to sin, unrighteousness and rebellion? Look at our own lives. Are we not in danger of doing the same thing? Friday, May 14. In the Seventh Day of Venice Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1077, in the Ellen G. White comments, we read, The spirit of bondage is engendered by seeking to live in accordance with legal religion, through striving to fulfil the claims of the law in our own strength. There is hope for us only as we come under the Abrahamic covenant, which is the covenant of grace by faith in Christ Jesus. The gospel preached to Abraham, through which he had hope, was the same gospel that is preached to us today, through which we have hope. Abraham looked unto Jesus, who is also the author and finisher of our faith, and then by the same writer in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 334. During the bondage in Egypt, many of the Israelites had, to a great extent, lost the knowledge of God's law, and had mingled its precepts with heathen customs and traditions. God brought them to Sinai, and there with his own voice declared his law. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. In what ways was the covenant relationship designed to maintain Israel's physical and spiritual freedoms? Well, let's have a look at Leviticus 26, verses 3 to 13. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. For I will look on you favourably, and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest, and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you, and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves." I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. And Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 15. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and flee before you seven ways. 
the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods, in the fruit of your body, and in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand." You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or the left, to go after other gods to serve them. But... It shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And question 2. Read again Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Notice that the Lord makes this statement, All the earth is mine. Why would he say that, particularly in this context, one of seeking to establish a covenant with these people? How does our understanding of the Sabbath and what it means fit in here? And three, we understand that we are forgiven our sins only through God's grace. How do we understand the role of God's grace in enabling us to live a life of faith and obedience? And to summarise this week's lesson... The covenant God formed with Israel at Sinai was a covenant of grace. Having given abundant evidence of his gracious love and care by an extraordinary deliverance from Egyptian slavery, God invited the nation into a covenant with him that would maintain and promote their freedoms. Although Israel responded in the affirmative, they lacked a true faith motivated by love. Their later history indicates that, for the most part, they failed to understand the true nature of the covenant and corrupted it into a salvation-by-works system. We need not follow Israel's failure and ignore the marvellous grace that has been extended to sinners.